Computational Audiology Network from complex models to clinical care, digital health and patient-centered outcomes. Welcome uh, everybody. I'm really excited to uh, record this second episode of the Computational Audiology Network podcast and um, really happy with today's guests. Uh, Jessica Monaghan, she's uh, working for the NAL at Sydney. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning. And uh, Nikki Chong White, she's also working for NAL in uh, Sydney. Good morning, Nikki. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Jessica and uh, Nikki, for spending your weekend uh, in this uh, podcast <laughs> or sacrificing it. And uh, Dmitry Karnevsky from uh, Google. Uh, you're stationed in uh, New York, so uh, good afternoon, Dimitri. Good afternoon. Good uh, to see you all. And um, um, before we further start this interview, I would like to explain everybody at home um, the system we are using. Uh, so I prepared a short statement, a disclaimer. So you're witnessing a recording of an interview that was prepared as an experiment using automated speech recognition. So that's a system that translates speech to text, all live. Uh, one of the participants, Dmitry Konevsky, is deaf and he, he reads the transcript. And he needs this to follow the discussion. The other participants are normal hearing. Um, and we all need to take time to read the transcript and confirm that we understand each other. So that's for us uh, something new to take into account. I'm used to uh, listening to somebody and reading then sometimes the transcript, but not talking myself and reading the transcript. So we'll see how that will uh, work out. Um, we are using Google Meet and uh, Google Relate. It's a, a prototype system, not yet publicly released. And it's uh, been specifically trained on Dimitri's speech. Uh, and in addition, we are in different time zones. Jessica and Nikki are 10 hours uh, ahead of us. And Dimitri is uh, six hours uh, lagging. So we are 16 hours apart. And we haven't met in person uh, before. So yeah, that can be sometimes uh, a, b a barrier. And um, English is not, uh, well, my, my first uh, language, nor Dimitri's. So um, that might be a challenge for the speech recognition system as well. So let's uh, hope that uh, technology will not fail us. And uh, there will be a video recording and audio only recording. And the edited video recording will also include the transcript of what is said by Dimitri. Um, yeah, and I guess for people at home, um, yeah, the final recording may look different than from how it's uh, experienced live. Um, I was really glad that we were able to practice this a little bit. And yeah, I would like to continue with uh, introducing the first guest, uh, Jessica Monaghan. Um, yeah, Jessica, I think we met two years ago, if I we remember did, did. well. You remember her, the VCCA? Beaver, yes. Uh... <laughs> I remember I gave the first talk. Yes, that indeed. Was, and I, I remember <laughs> I was a little uh, nervous and I think your video clip, it didn't start up right away, but uh, uh, you kept your cool. And I thought, then um, it, I guess it will bring uh, good luck today as well. So um, hey, you work as a research scientist at the NAL in, in Sydney and with a special interest in machine learning uh, in audiology. Uh, you studied physics in Cambridge in the UK and received a PhD in Nottingham. Uh, and then you continued working as a research uh, fellow in Southampton. And your work is focused on speech recognition and how to improve this in case of hearing loss. And you shared that you recently have studied the effect of um, face masks on speech recognition. And Jessica, could you explain us your initial interest for uh, ASR? or automated speech recognition? Thank you. So I started researching using ASR as a master's student in Roy Patterson's lab in Cambridge. 
And that was also my first experience of research and my first introduction to uh, using machine learning. So that was something that I found really uh, fascinating. And there I was working on a project trying to improve the robustness of speech recognition to different talk by using a, a human auditory uh, model as a front end to try and give it the same uh, robustness to different speakers. When a human hears someone talk, they don't need, uh, um, they hear the same thing no matter what, what someone's saying. And despite the different acoustics of the situation. But yeah, at the time, automatic speech recognition had to be uh, trained a bit more for individual speakers. So that was really interesting. And um, I worked in other areas uh, for my PhD and postdoc, although still looking at machine learning. But uh, I always retained this interest in automatic speech recognition. And then when I started working at now, that was in 2020. So it was just at the start of the pandemic. And so we were seeing the impact of uh, face masks and barriers on um, communication, particularly in clinics. And so we, we'd uh, done this research um, looking at uh, how face masks impacted speech and how we could uh, apply a particular gain to try and improve understanding for hearing aid users. And with the ubiquity of ASR um, by that point and having it on, on different devices, then it was a kind of uh, clear up to us to, that that could be used to, to aid communication. So I was really um, excited to uh, work on NowScribe with Nikki um, and she'll probably talk more about that uh, next. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that Nico will further explain Nullscribe. And I just wondered with this effect of the face mask, is it then more acoustics like filtering or does it have an effect on your articulation? Apparently there isn't much effect on your articulation. It really is just the filtering effect of the mask. Okay. Because I experience sometimes that if you wear a mask and then your chin is push, yeah, pulling more or less your a uh, mask from your nose and then you're well maybe not articulating that well but you didn't see that effect no no in fact for instance uh surgical face masks don't have much effect on the acoustics even though they're kind of constricting your face in the same way as as other masks so yeah okay. it seems to be just an acoustic filter so it was primarily a gain or about some compensation that you could then build into your system Yes, that's right. Uh, so you could apply it as an additional gain for hearing aids. So that would be a setting that they could change to a mask mode when they needed that. Ah, cool. So you've applied it to different devices, both the uh, null scribe then as in, in hearing aid uh, prescriptions. So yeah, we haven't applied that to null scribe, but we did find that it oh. worked quite well with masks nevertheless we we did some tests on that ah, okay yeah I, I i thought that it was also applied to null scribes but it's then in the hearing aid devices and the rehabilitation that you applied it yes that's right we considered applying it to now scribe but since since you're able to be quite close to the, the microphone then we it was um the calculations were done assuming the the talker um, would be at some distance from the speaker. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, we found it wasn't really necessary. Okay, good to know. And then um, I guess a good a moment to uh, get over to Nikki. Um, Nikki, you led development of app. Um, previously, you studied uh, electrical engineering at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and you received a PhD in speech signal processing at the University of Wollongong in Australia. Are you recognize at least the name? And then you worked as a DSP engineer with several research organizations, including Motorola Australian Research Center and the AT&T Labs. I oh, see that you hold 10 patents and uh, yeah, you were the uh, lead developer of Nullscribe, uh, a live captioning app to help uh, people with hearing difficulties. Um, could you uh, explain us uh, how why you started um, um, developing this this app or where your interest in 
uh, speech recognition uh, initiated. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm impressed that it's got Wollongong, correct? Um, <laughs> there you go. And so um, someone must have programmed that in, I'm sure. Uh, yes, I did my uh, PhD in speech signal processing um, at Wollongong University, and that was probably my first uh, sort of introduction to digital signal processing techniques to analyze speech features um, and find efficient sort of parameter representations of speech. And so even though during my PhD, I was focused on speech analysis and coding and a little bit of synthesis, um, it's all the same methods that are used in speech recognition. So it was quite a strong foundation. And then after that, when I worked at at and Labs and I think one of my first meetings there was a presentation by a group who had just recently, they'd recently released this new um, intelligent voice response system, which was called behind the scenes, we called it, how may I help you? And that was when um, an at and customer could just ring up on the phone. And instead of being met with this automated sort of robotic system that said, press one for accounts, press two for products and services. Um, you just had a voice, another automated voice that said, how may I help you? And the person, the customer could just speak naturally and say, uh, no, I'd like to pay my bill. And that was quite mind blowing at the time. This was um, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, and I think was the first sort of system like that. And then the, I think that really inspired me to delve more into speech recognition and natural language understanding. So yeah, fast forward, what, 20 years, uh, we're working at uh, NAL and <laughs> um, with the, the pandemic and we saw now opportunities where we could revisit um, what we've done previously in speech recognition and really now um, not so much develop it further ourselves, but how do we apply that uh, speech recognition technology and package it in an easy way for people to access? And um, yeah, that was when we were doing research on um, a lot of user research on the problems they were finding uh, with communication, with masks especially, um, that was when we thought there's there's a real opportunity here to to produce something um, that can really help people and and make a difference because we were discovering people had really strong emotions um, like negative emotions when mm -hmm. they were trying to communicate it was frustration and embarrassment and anxiety uh, people who didn't want to go out like they were staying home or avoiding those social interactions because um all those communication difficulties mm -hmm. so uh that was the motivation behind uh now wow well, yeah and also impressive how much has happened then in well 20 years in improvement in these systems so if i understand well it has been more focused on the last part in the design, how to make people use the technology or that you yeah, translate it into benefits for persons in using it? Yeah, that's right. You know, amazing researchers like, you know, the people at Google and Apple and Microsoft who have done all the hard yards and collected all this data that we can, we now have these more sophisticated training methods. We're not just using our acoustic models and having this little speech corpus to work with. Um, it's just millions and or more than millions of hours of speech in mm -hmm. real situations from YouTube, from phone calls, from everything. Uh, our focus at now is how do we turn that into something that, that can um, help people. Thank you, uh, Nikki. And I think we cannot wait any longer with uh, listening to Dimitri, who has done a, quite some work, I guess, that. Uh, uh, was uh, important preparation for uh, the later work done by Nikki and Jessica. Uh, Dimitri, you work as a 
researcher at Google. Um, you lost your hearing in early childhood. Um, I understood you studied mathematics in uh, uh, Moscow and also received a PhD there. And then you started uh, working at various research uh, centers, including the Max Planck Institute in Bonn in Germany, and also the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, the USA. Um, and then you joined IBM in 1986. Um, and I think you've been working for more than 25 years in speech recognition, if I'm correct, uh, Dimitri. And then you uh, yeah, joined Google uh, somewhere in the last five years, I think. I didn't know the exact date. Um, I saw that you uh, had developed Google Live Transcribe, Google Relate, the systems we are now using today. But you also worked on other technologies to improve accessibility. And um, in 2012, uh, Dimitri was honored at the White House as a champion of change for his efforts to advance access to science, technology, engineering, and math for people with disabilities. And um, Dimitri currently holds over 295 patents. So I, I hope this was captured well. And uh, well, Dimitri, I'm really honored to have you here in the in the show. And um, I, I, I wondered when with your uh, motivation to work on speech recognition, when you decided to study mathematics, did you already have that ambition then to work on in this field? I had no intention to do speech recognition when I did math. After my dream was to work forever in mathematics. But then, after I received PhD, at that time it was Soviet Union. My family and I decided to emigrate to Israel. And I lived very well in Russia. But I realized that I would be able to live so well in Hebrew and in English. Mm -hmm. So, I knew that haptics help me to repeat better. So, when I was waiting for permission from the Soviet Union to emigrate to Israel, it was about 10 months. I learned electric engineering and developed haptic wearable device that has several channels. One channel just for low band audio, just amplification, but other transform high frequency to low frequencies. So I could understand frequencies. In Hebrew, you have a lot. Shalom, Shabbat, Akshav. <laughs> so yeah, that language I is not this device to Israel. It had small speech recognition technology. And I got some grant from Israel government and developed start up. And this device was had a lot of impact. It was first wearable haptic device. But I continue to do mathematics. But when I emigrated, when I went to America and worked at the Institute for Advanced Study, it was very difficult because there were no transcription services at all in America. And I decided that I should work in speech recognition and to make temporal break in mathematics and develop communication means for me. And because I developed this haptic speech technology, IBM speech recognition took me. They did not take just some abstract mathematician. They took person who 
could do practical application for in five years we develop digital cognition technology that will solve all my problems and other people's problems. Mm -hmm. Five years passed. No. And for next five years, next five years, that lasted for 25 years that I blame, where we developed good algorithms that improved significantly, but still not enough to be used for communication. Then in 2014, I moved to Google, and there finally we achieved very good picture recognition accuracy, our team. And I moved to California from New York to develop practical application. This is my story. And now I went back to mathematics. I started to again do mathematics and solve 50 years old mathematical problem that my advisor gave me 50 years ago. And finally had time to think of it and finish it. <laughs> Wow, great. So uh, problem was a little bit uh, underestimated. You needed much more time to, to solve the problem of speech recognition. And we are um, all um, having benefit of this today. So glad to hear you have now more time for your other passion of mathematics. And But it's still, is there a mathematics and the tools maybe that you developed there and the, for instance, machine learning or the data analysis that is needed for the speech recognition? First, I get to work as a mathematician in speech recognition. I develop new optimization algorithm. I don't know if you heard about baum welch algorithm for hidden markov model. At that mm -hmm. time, it worked only for polynomials, for polynomial function, for maximum likelihood. And nobody knew how to extend this to different kinds of objective functions, like maximum mutual information. And my contribution was I discovered an algorithm that could extend extended baum -Wilch. It extended efficient quasi-linear algorithm to different type of objective function. It is allowed significantly improve speech recognition accuracy. But now I indeed try to apply my abstract mathematic algebraic geometry, number theory in machine learning. I'm trying to develop new kind of machine learning that based on more abstract mathematics. Wow, um, impressive. And I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm not able to fully uh, grasp and, and appreciate it in uh, um, how you uh, have been able to do this. And so um, I expect then also that you've been working probably in a, in a team with many different specialists for developing, for instance, Google Live Transcribe. Absolutely correct. Google Live Transcribe became possible because I had very remarkable co-worker, my friend, Chat, who was compassionate to difficulties that I had. At that time, I used only manual transcription services from stenography. And I told Chet that speech recognition only is good enough you have already this speech recognition in a Google document, Google Docs. Mm -hmm. But you need to click on microphone each time that you want to speak. And it immediately stop if you do pause. I could not use this for conversation. So 
он уйкен, портит весь систем, это андроид, гельми фос протатайт. Эрнсит хай стартит, и полишит ид, тестит по юзер, агит мене ландвиджи, лай транскрай вос борн, и год, if you know, we are talented people, like Sager, and others who was project manager, you got team, big team of software developers that implemented this. You got also sound notification, so you could detect if the dog barked, baby crying. You continue to add more and more wonderful features. For example, now we are adding offline speech recognition. Now, live transcribe has offline speech recognition. Before, live transcribe required data or Wi Fi connection. Now, you can use live transcribe. It's beginning to be going to public. Soon you can use this in elevator where you lose in connection. You can use this in India, in Africa, where there are no good network connection. Wow, that's a really, I think, important development. Also, the uh, robustness of this system yeah, with uh, low connectivity. Um, and, and Jessica, I remember you also had a question for Dimitri that maybe fits in nicely, I think, now in his explanation so far. So I was wondering if in your experience of using ASR and developing it, whether, so did you just see a, a gradual improvement or was there a particular step change that, that you can recall in, in the accuracy? Yes two factors related to significant improvement of accuracy. First, user network, of course. Computers became powerful enough to process faster user network. And second factor was that you got unlimited data for training from YouTube. This was actually my basic work at Google because YouTube has manually uploaded caption. But manually uploaded caption has a lot of errors. You could not use it directly to train speech recognition. So you put filter that with high probability detected each audio segment had good manual transcription and you got so much data that in one day you suddenly improved speech recognition by many many percent i remember before that you could spend several years and we're very happy to improve speech recognition accuracy by quarter of percent suddenly every day five percent improvement after more five percent improvement it was exciting in our team wow wonderful and jessica do you have uh follow-up questions or, or nikki is there something you would like to add or or ask to dimitri um yeah my main question to dimitri was yeah what what are the the next barriers to overcome like that you see um what's going to get you that well i don't know if we can get an extra five percent um improvement but is there something that you see is is holding back the accuracy to where it is today or can we have we have are we close to the limit or is, is there still a lot of room for improvement i think the next barrier there are people who have non-standard speech like me. 
он идет и друг, ведут на пад, медный припас, пики на лайки мне. Все, когда на трус, идет и друг, дата, то креет модель, фам... and if you have people who have L, L, S. Now, our speech recognition works for them to, but we need a record specifically. So, really, specifically, get data from people with non-standard speech, they record and they get for them speech recognition. But also this model is local. What you just see now, is not on network. It is on my device. An actor can understand you also very well. Don't want to try. Get me turn connection. Do, do you want to speak? And you will see it will start to transcribe you. Please speak. Okay. I'd say, uh, Nikki, honor is yours to <laughs> have a try. <laughs> oh, so it was, no, it's Kenyak speak. The, the next thing coming, more uh, personalized uh, speech recognition for, for individuals and training. Um, when I'm looking now and looking at your transcription and, and the transcription that comes with Google Meet, I can, I can definitely see that your transcription is better. So, yeah, it does show a lot of promise for that individual training and the benefits that you can get um yeah i guess yeah the next thing is how how can people do that without spending a whole year to train like you have and and many hours can that be done more efficiently maybe by i'm just <laughs> thinking here and sounds and targeting uh that training material to make it, um, yeah, to improve accuracy. So definitely very interesting uh, times ahead. And, and Dimitri, if, uh, if could... so my local speech recognition, not all understand me, it understand other people. This is fantastic. Yes. And answer your question, I feel solution comes when we get enough clusters of similar speakers, people who have LLS, we got a lot of speech from different people with LLS. So a new person comes, that person does not need to train too much. So this is a eventual solution for all accents. Accumulate a lot of clusters. Yeah, I actually had to. I will stop transcribing yeah. my local system so that it doesn't distract. I had two uh, follow up questions. One is beforehand, we thought, well, will the system have troubles with our accents? Uh, like uh, Jessica, Nikki, and I all speak differently, but looks like there have been already quite some clusters of british or new zealanders speech or uh, the dutch accent speech um so my question would be more like what role could clinics play here because i think that clinics can help in collecting or motivating groups of patients with similar disease or similar symptoms similar uh, atypical speech and that could help then in collecting data. Um, what do you, uh, what do the three of you think of this? And, uh, and maybe, uh, Nikki, you have already working also with different clinics in, in Australia. Um, what could, could there be an opportunity? Um, sorry, my AirPods just went flat there so i may i'm just relying on the captions <laughs> to okay. uh, understand what you just said <laughs> um yeah we because we release now scribe and we've been doing um some more clinical testing so uh we are looking at how it has been performing 
um, in Australian clinics, in US clinics, um, and now uh, coming up in, in the Netherlands. Uh, we do have different variants of English that um, our, the user can select. Um, I'm not quite sure, yeah, how, how different they are when you select Australian English versus British English. Um, how similar are these models? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think what's the question more in terms of um, atypical speech? We haven't actually delved quite into that um, yet, but it would be interesting. Yes, I, I think it's also looking, it's about finding useful clusters because, for instance, in the UK also yeah, from city to city, the accent is different and you could uh, debate whether that is UK English or uh, the same is also in the in the Netherlands that in some regions, yeah, the accent is quite, it's a, a, di a dialect. Yeah? So then just the label Dutch doesn't uh, capture it all. So how would, what would be then a good strategy to, to know when, uh, when you have a, a valid cluster or something or, an, and yeah, I'm wondering who's best to address that question in uh, the atypical speech. So Nikki, you didn't yet uh, look into this problem. No, and we uh, have been mainly looking um, at the use case where it is a normal hearing speaker uh, speaking to a hearing impaired person in that clinical setting to improve that communication. Um, yeah, definitely to look at more of that two way communication is something that um, would be would be really interesting. Uh, but in the yeah, in the development of of Nalscry, we were really looking at um, the hearing impaired person as, as the listener. Okay, yeah, and then that brings me to the follow-up question then for broader applications of this technology and also what you now bring up, the barriers of uh, communication between people irregardless of hearing status. So, yeah, Nikki, it's actually a good example now that you are also now relying on the transcription. So we have now two people listening and two people reading. And uh, so Nikki, maybe you experienced some new barriers or um, um, what do you think um, could be the, the next uh, steps to relieve this? And maybe good if I uh, ask you, Jessica, if you would, comment on how to further yeah, develop this with the opportunities that uh, well already are uh, described before? Okay, uh, so I think the, the next advance would be really to take advantage of the technology that we already have. So there are all of these situations where, um, particularly at the moment, where there are in fact physical barriers to communication. If, if someone with a hearing difficulty goes to their GP clinic and they can't be understood at reception because they're not using a technology that's widely available to I think that's you know, it's excluding people unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of situations where this could be beneficial already. And particularly in that situation is quite quite a good one. If you have a business that has a, a tablet and a microphone, then even if you're in a noisy waiting room then they're able to take advantage of that good signal to noise ratio and typically get very good captions so i think that's that's uh um yeah using existing technology and in terms of future technology what i think is very exciting is the emergence of augmented reality systems so ar glasses so if you had captions on an ar glass uh, ar glasses so you could see the captions when you when you look at a particular person or different captions for different people and maybe additional um, information about uh, uh, sounds that are going on around you. I think that would that be a, is going to be a really wonderful um, new use of technology. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that could really help in this uh, augmented reality. Um, 
it also brings me to another question maybe to you nikki of if people start reading from a tablet how does it affect for instance their ability to read lips and uh, have and also include the facial expression Yes, we've had uh, feedback and um, recommendations that we can put forward um, based on the experience of just observing how people are interacting and using um, this, this technology in a clinic situation. And definitely um, people with hearing loss and even people without hearing loss uh, like to read lips and we've, that's just become more apparent when everyone's wearing face masks. And even as a normal hearer, I struggle to understand because they've just taken away this facial lip cue which i didn't mm -hmm. really even know i was using um yeah. but now that i don't have it i i have I, I find i just need to concentrate harder on understanding so yeah we do encourage when it, when it's used for the tablet to be placed close to the person's face um so that they can don't have to do a full head turn to turn between the tablet and the person speaking um, we're encouraging people to pause more um, after that while in between sentences so that um, the person who's reading the caption has time to basically catch up. Um, we found a lot of people saying they like the captions uh, to confirm what they've heard. So um, a lot of people may, may be listening and be able to recognize all the words, but uh, maybe it takes a little bit longer for them to process and understand and really get a good enough understanding to be able to engage fully in the conversation yeah definitely positioning of that screen is really important of course when we all do have augmented reality glasses that may make things a lot easier but until that becomes more available and then affordable for the average person um certainly there are definitely things you can do with the existing technology to make it easier and hopefully we can pass more of those acceptability barriers so is it acceptable for use is it a mm -hmm. usable thing if we can't get past that then it doesn't matter how good the technology is people will just come up with other strategies so but then it sounds to me that you had actually uh a lucky situation that because people were wearing a face mask they lost lip reading anyway and the step to using a tablet then for reading text was smaller and it could be that as soon as people get familiar with this technology then in the future yeah we'll find maybe hybrid ways of how to use this technology and um, in your approach in developing, um, I read you follow the more holistic approach in uh, in your design. Is there something in particular that helped you here in better uh, finding the, the needs and how to maybe change your design in this process? Um, yeah, we followed uh, what's known as a design thinking process. So really starting from the customer and the user point of view, what are their problems and needs? And as you've just mentioned, the mask really heightened that need. Um, generally, the people with um, a disability are your first adopters of such a technology. Uh, with masks, it basically gave everyone a disability. And when we really make that need so much stronger, um, yeah, it does reduce that barrier. It makes it more likely that uh, the technology um, can be more mainstream and picked up um, by more people. Yeah, we went through a, um, an iterative process of understanding the need, coming up with a prototype and putting something out there. Um, our first version of Nalscribe was really basic. It really had very little features. Um, and as we uh, would talk to our users, we found things like they really wanted the privacy. They wanted that offline mode um, for a clinical setting. Um, they wanted the screen automatically cleared um, when they used it in a reception counter use case where you don't want um, the next person in line to see what the mm. previous conversation that was had between two people. So all these little things um, would, yeah, we, we took note of and we could um, incorporate that into our app. 
nice and and um i think uh, dimitri i i saw you uh wrote this paper about different use cases uh, some of those use cases are also covered by by nikki but i also saw the example of for instance students listening to a professor uh, an, uh, a lesson and when you are briefly uh interrupted by something else uh, a message on your phone and then you want to get into the story again you can read the transcript and that way it could be of course also come in handy for uh, people without a hearing loss um and dimitri did you for um getting to these use cases what kind of strategy did you follow was it based on what you experience yourself or did you also ask uh, other people with uh, hearing loss i hope my question was transcribed clearly we indeed considered various strategies and sometimes you don't want to listen to transcript to meeting all the time you need to want to do something else. Maybe you are bored a little bit with mm -hmm. and you got interesting messages in your phone. So you can look into phone, then you can miss something. That way, glasses were very useful. I don't know if you saw, you already published a paper about using transcription in glasses. I don't know if you saw this. I didn't see it yet, but I see. Yes. So how was I that experience with the glasses? How nice it have glasses when you interact. It shows video where I have dinner with a lot of people. So I do not need to put on plate mobile phone and look on transcription. I'm enjoying, I'm looking at every board. I can eat and, and follow transcription. So back to your example, I can do something else, but transcription running in glasses. I continue to follow transcription of what is being spoken. But you also have in a live transcribe it might break if somebody calls me. So if I'm using like transcribe, it always integrated with my haptic device. Mm -hmm. If somebody calls me, Dimitri, it starts to vibrate. I know people are calling me. So this is all user cases, scenarios that we can see there. You're absolutely right. Glasses change human interaction completely you can easily follow presentation otherwise you read caption in this place and lecture point to something and you do not know what he pointed at in glasses you see what was pointed in slides and you read transcription you describe all these user cases and, and Dimitri, are you using all these technologies now in, in daily life? So if you have a, a dinner with friends, you're using already these glasses? Sometimes I'm using these glasses. And, and what are reasons for you then not to do it? Now, now I do not need it. It's very convenient. Not really. I'm not planning to start to watch my phone. Maybe yeah, yeah, okay. When you are talking, we I'm we have your full attention. To you. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, let's see for the, the, the for this uh, round of uh, the potential applications. I think there's, of course, uh, most important the. Uh, the user, the end user, the person with hearing loss, but uh, also the clinician could be a, a user of this technology or play a, a role. Um, what role do you see for clinicians in either 
promoting this technology better for prospective users or to help in validating the technology or improving the technology what are your thoughts and uh, let's say if i don't give a turn how this will work now in the system so feel free to answer take the initiative um oh. <laughs> I was just going to talk a bit about how I thought it was um, particularly useful for medical situations. So we know that people with hearing difficulties um, are at a disadvantage, so they have worse health outcomes and um, higher rates of uh, rehospitalization, mm -hmm. uh, low compliance with medication, and all of these factors are uh, magnified if they if they have said that they have poor communication with their physician so i think in that situation it, it's a really um really valuable for the clinician that they know that the information the important information that they they're trying to get across is actually it has been understood um and also this possibility of then having a transcript that they can the patient can take home or they can share with a, a carer um and yeah hopefully that should um improve um the situation uh yeah improve outcomes a lot um but in terms of actually validating it in the clinic i think you know if we if we have so we did we did tests in the clinics and we did some questionnaires and i think the the value there is really that it it demonstrates uh, to the clinicians that this is a worthwhile thing to do, that there's actual benefit because of course they, they do have a lot of skills, particularly audiologists at uh, communicating with hearing impaired people. So they may not feel that they actually need any, any help with that. That's what they do every day. And mm -hmm. so it gives them some confidence that actually um, clients do find a benefit um and it's it's valuable and also that helps them to adjust to the uh, clinic owners that if there's some expense or some some uh, time that's needed to to get these systems set up that it's worthwhile that it's providing benefit and increasing satisfaction thank you uh, jessica and also interesting point you raised of clinicians actually being maybe a, a barrier sometimes if they feel that they they don't need it because hey, they're already um taking into account in their communication uh Nikki, did you find this in in your pilot that uh, clinicians were not open to this technology um i think in our in our pilot uh our clinicians were very encouraged to um to try it out uh i think it was maybe more of a barrier from the the client point of view who thought um depending on the degree of hearing loss, if someone doesn't have a severe hearing loss, they would say, no, I don't need it, I'm okay. Um, but through our own experience, we thought even just as an assistive thing, you're not relying mm -hmm. on the captions, but just having it there can be helpful. So we were trying to encourage more and more people to use it, or at least just experience it the, for a little bit, um, just to see, how how they thought of it because you don't really know it's with any technology you don't really know what it does and, until mm -hmm. you actually try it and i think also with um a, a good way that clinicians can help to show this technology to um especially our older clients who aren't so tech savvy and mm -hmm. um have an experience you know discovered this on their phones for themselves um, we had some clients say, wow, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> and we're like, there are other apps that have been around at least a few years or so that, that have been doing this. It's not groundbreakingly novel right now. Yeah. Giving that introduction to, to more people can, the clinicians can help us in that way. Um, and then just one other point I wanted to make is we know that an improved client clinician relationship leads to better hearing outcomes in the clinic and definitely 
introducing live captions and being able to make that client feel more valued, more included. Um, mm -hmm. We understand uh, your difficulties and this is what we're doing to take steps to improve that for you. I think that can really add to um, the rapport and the relationship building, not just in the clinic, but in, in personal situations mm -hmm. as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's another good advantage. And for our clinicians now, maybe uh, listening to this podcast, do you recommend, oh, there's a kind of minimum hearing loss or a type of persons that you say you should definitely recommend them to use these apps? Uh, we certainly recommended for um, more severe hearing losses or complex cases, but it, it can help over a very wide range. So I wouldn't say don't offer it to people with more mild hearing losses, because um, then it, it also works well in appointments where there's um, a partner or a significant other there. Um, mm -hmm. It has a lot of, yeah, wide ranging benefits. So definitely the people with severe hearing loss um, were more sort of excited about it. And, and we could definitely tell that they, they gained, you know, most benefit, but I think there mm -hmm. is benefit there for everyone. And, and do you think it could also work the other way around that if people experience benefits of these apps that then they are also more open for other uh, assistive technologies? Yes, certainly. And even as I'm talking here and we're reading our captions, uh, it does encourage me to speak more clearly and more mm -hmm. slowly yeah. and uh, enunciate better to make sure that I'm understood. So I think it does. Yeah, it's also helping me, even though I'm not relying. I actually do have audio through the speakers now. Um, okay. I'm not relying on just the captions. Uh, to understand, uh, yeah, it is helping uh, training my voice better. And as you've mentioned, we all have different accents and mm -hmm. uh, little nuances in the way we speak. So, yeah, it, it, it helps that part of uh, the speaker's communication, not just the listener. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. It gives feedback both to the listener as the talker and both can learn from it, um, expect it, it will also improve my English, for instance, by just seeing when uh, there are regular errors. Um, so that's uh, interesting that this feedback can be uh, used for, for training. Or I can also imagine that for some people, it could help to just focus. You have one channel of information instead of many different modes uh, and that it could help uh, with people with attention uh, deficits. Jessica, I see you raise your hand. I was, I was just going to make a comment about that. It reminded me there's a campaign in the UK at the moment that parents should switch on subtitles on their televisions because research has shown that it helps children to learn to, who are learning to read and improves their reading ability. So I thought that was an interesting uh, yes, that's... Yeah, use of the technology. A nice example of something probably not foreseen when developing the technology. And I guess that if uh, there is a widespread use of both the speech recognition systems, but also, for instance, these uh, earbuds, uh, I see many young people wearing it and it reduces the stigma also of using hearing aids, for instance, because any, everybody has something in their ears and if everybody gets used to uh, closed caption, for instance, now in the Netherlands, it would look really funny if uh, uh, a person would get a uh, closed caption because that's only done for people with dialect. Uh, but that uh, so then it would be maybe good if everybody on television would receive closed caption also for her. Uh, there's people who need this or are complaining um, that uh, they cannot follow. Uh, interviews uh, and it brings me maybe to another question that one of the main complaints that my patients tell me is that they want to better understand their grandchildren and a big problem is that the children are moving around all the time but also they have voices that are probably less 
familiar to these systems because there's not so much recordings on YouTube of three-year-old or five, four, five-year-old children. So, um, Dimitri, do you think there are solutions for this? Because uh, I would put it uh, high on the priorities for uh, future developments. I do have patent that I receive at IBM for speech recognition that learn to recognize babies while baby are crying. Do they have stomach? Ah. Or they scarred something. And suggestion to create this data came expert who spent a lot of time with babies they can interpret why baby are crying so they could teach speech recognition system that parents who have the first baby they could rely on this system wow that's but that's I don't wonderful. remember reading in news that this was developed. Maybe it was developed, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I also had similar system to recognize dog barks. Well, if we found that this system was developed, it would be nice to see. So if I understand well, then the system was warning and it could either be a dog barking or a baby crying or? It could explain you why dog is barking. <laughs> is dog hungry or somebody trying to enter the house. Yeah. So for safety and uh, um, uh, sound aware or spatial awareness, uh, a really important feature. Jessica, I see you have uh, another comment or question. Um, so, yeah, so that sounds really, I would like a, to have had a baby interpreter, I can tell you. Um, but I, I saw there was a paper from um, Google uh, or maybe from DeepMind uh, about uh, speech recognition with from children. So because they have this YouTube kids app, they actually have a big database of children's speech from them trying to interact with this tablet. And they did uh, tr try applying um, uh, a, a system trained with, with children's speech uh, to try and improve the uh, recognition and then got a, a, a small increase in accuracy. So I thought that was really interesting that they had, nice. had this database. So that's a voice control by toddlers that's collected them and this way they can better command their uh, grandparents in the future. <laughs> that's right. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but one of the jerks when we discuss and develop in such system, this will prevent toddlers to improve their pronunciation. Yeah. Now they're trying to speak better, so parents understand them. But if everybody understands them, no matter what they remember, this will be a big problem for their development. Nikki, I see you want to respond. I see. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I, I just had a thought when you said that um, I think a, an a application of um, automated speech recognition could be in speech therapy and uh, training children who have speech um, deficits or um, trouble pronouncing certain sounds to help them uh, develop their speech more. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, as, as an application uh, to get have a automated recognition, give the child feedback. And I know even in my own circumstances, we have a Google Home and my son will ask it a question in the morning. Um, and Google says very politely, um, sorry, I didn't understand that. 
And so he will repeat and uh, change the way he's speaking to speak more clearly so that uh, Google understands. And um, I think it's a good way to do it because as a parent, when I was trying to do speech therapy with my child, you can, you try not to, um, a little bit impatient, but um, an automated system and computer has all the time in the world um, and can be uh, quite engaging for a child to interact with. So yeah, another application for speech recognition. Yes, and um, so there's machine learning, but this is more about the, the human learning. And um, then I wonder how do you get the right direction of the learning if the machines would adapt too fast to the speech of the children then they never need to develop anymore because eh? they're understood so the machine somehow needs to encourage or motivate the children to improve their speech while in the same way yeah when communicating is important with the relatives the system should allow it um, any thoughts on, on this, uh, Dimitri, how we could both train uh, humans and machines? Yes, this pattern is on your road, that on your address this point. It suggested incremental improvement. So if it's too far from baby to speak normal, future cognition understand, but if speech recognition see that small changes for babies needed to speak correctly, it pretends that it does not understand. <laughs> this way, babies improving for small things, but yeah. still they understood for very difficult yeah. things that they cannot improve right away. Wow. Now that you mentioned the same technology is also, I think, what we need in fitting cochlear implants. Because there, if you make a too big a step in change of the patterns that people hear, they have difficulties in adjusting to it and, and, and improving. While when making smaller steps or the, the right steps, not too small and not too big, then they're improving better. So yeah, that's, of course, completely away from the speech recognition, but it's, I think, the same principle of training or, or somehow right, uh, providing personalized care or personalized medicine eh, in adapting the treatment to the proper doses. Looking time-wise, I, uh, I don't know how, uh, how you're running out of time, and I think it's really nice that we have um, touched other topics already. And it looks like we can somehow um, loose, loosen up the structure a little bit, huh? that it's more spontaneous than we thought uh, before. Uh, but uh, I think it's a, a good point to uh, wrap up. And um, yeah, I want to thank you again for this uh, nice conversation. Uh, but also that, um, yeah, I feel I learned a lot about this topic, but also on how to use this uh, system. So uh, maybe everybody, if you'd like, could share uh, his or her experience in how you thought this interview and this technology uh, went. Mm. So Jessica, what, how, how do you think, or what did you experience? Oh, yeah. I don't hear you now. <laughs> Apart from that slight technical hitch. So yeah, I find the captions really accurate for me, considering I normally I, I have to select British English or uh, put on my best Australian accent for it to, to understand me. Um, and luckily I haven't had to do that because I have to live here. Um, that's been really great. And I'm just amazed by uh, the technology with uh, Dimitri's captions that's such a such a great experience it's really um yeah I thought it might be not that conducive to having uh an easy conversation but it's yeah it's been really smooth so I'm very impressed Dimitri 
كان كيشوفوا جو كاين وفود ان اي ريلي واز ان جورجن توكن تو جو هير ان ساك فريش بونت اوف جو ان اي دو اجري اوف جو ذات اكتلي سبيت سيستم ذات فوكسد اون ساب اكسنت لايك بريتش اكسنت انديا اكسنت مين لو توك وير از جنرال سبيت ريكوجنيشن بيكوز فور ذا جنرال سبيت ريكوجنيشن هيد And many hundred thousands of speech recorded. But maybe you do not have so many hours for accent. And usually, that you have all kinds of accent. You do have in a life transcribe also special accent, India, British, Australian. But I found in general speech recognition. works for all accents but really nice uh dimitri and i think but also answers for me already the question about this smaller languages so it depends then probably on how active a community is on on youtube for how easy it will become uh, the, the more data of course the better because one of the other questions for me was that for instance I think Bengali is one of the 10 major languages, but it's uh, uh, poorly supported digitally. So that could have to do maybe lack of recordings of this language. Exactly. When we started to train for many languages, I could see that all other languages, Europe, had 10 times less recorded videos than English. So for a long time, English was the most accurate channel for speech recognition. And, and are there ways to circumvent this or to further improve that, that you need less data for these smaller languages? It was in the past. But now we are developing a lot of smart ways, that even for languages that we lost all speech, we can recreate how people speak. We have some development for very rare languages to develop speech recognition for them. Cool. But technology wow. is developing fast. And we started less and less relied on the amount of data, but trying to do it smart. Nice. And um, I'm thinking we should really um, have uh, another session on further de developing these uh, ideas. Uh, Nikki, how was your experience in this uh, session and your temporarily hearing loss? <laughs> Yes, it's been a really enjoyable discussion. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for setting this up and uh, thanks to Dimitri for, um, yeah, showcasing your Relate app as well. It's been, um, yeah, amazing to see the, the improvements you can have by training on additional training on your own voice. Um, it yeah makes me more excited about what we can do for the future um but yes generally it's it's been a yeah really good discussion and, and bringing up um, challenges um that it, we're still facing and uh sharing feedbacks on what we've done already so yeah i would yeah i'm sure we could talk for much longer <laughs> it's been yeah very good then uh, thank you all for uh, participating in this uh interview and yeah i wanted to close with the um, yeah the quote that i had prepared um be careful about reading health books you may die of a misprint famous words by uh, mark twain and um i was a little bit anxious that we maybe would uh, get into misunderstanding due to miss or wrong uh, transcriptions but i must say that uh yeah the both the technology as uh, you as participants uh, went all uh, better than uh, than expected. And uh, um, I felt that we could uh, relax more and more 
over this uh, conversation. So uh, thanks again for joining this and also for uh, all, yeah, all the preparation and uh, hope to uh, see you again uh, soon, maybe on a different uh, event or who knows on a, a future project. Uh, I guess we have discussed, discussed already a lot of um, potential work that uh, could be done. Thanks, Anne Willem. That was really great. And so nice to meet you, Dimitri. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.